Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce the next speaker, Catherine Borge. Uh, she is director of ISOG and has been since 2005, ISOG being the International Society of Genetic Genealogy, which aims to educate people about genetic genealogy and boasts over 8,000 members in 70 countries, so I'd certainly encourage you all to join. Um, Catherine is going to talk to us today about the Irish-American DNA connection. Thank you, Catherine. How many, keep your hands up if you've tested already. Oh, that's pretty good, about half. Um, when I first learned about using DNA for genealogy purposes, um, it went over my head and under my feet, so I try to speak as simply about it. I mean, some terms that you cannot, there's no substitutes for it, and that's usually the terms that apply to the DNA themselves. But I'm gonna do a brief uh, overview of using DNA for genealogy and how Possibly uh, American DNA and genealogy can help you with your Irish genealogy. So to begin with, um, the three most important things you need to know is that there are different types of tests. You don't have just one type of DNA in your body. You have different types of DNA in your body, and those different types of DNA um, can be used for your ancestry and genealogy purposes. Um, the second most important thing you need to know is the paths of transmission of that DNA in your body. And then the third most important thing for you to know is how that can work for you. Uh, usually when people come up and they say they want a DNA test, the first thing I ask them is, what are your goals? I don't believe in, in having you test and just ordering, um, you know, all, say all tests or just testing willy-nilly. It's better if you have a goal in mind to use it for. So, the four uh, main types of ancestry or genealogy DNA tests that are on the market. The first one is Y chromosome testing. That one is one of the most popular ones. It's also referred to as surname testing because in many countries, um, the surname follows on down, uh, if it's a patriarchal society, follows on down the male line just as the Y chromosome is passed. Um, you see that often in Ireland. Scotland and England. However, that does not apply in Portugal. My surname of Borges is Portuguese. My husband is Portuguese on his white chromosome. They did not adopt a surname, a patriarchal surname system until 1900. So Port Portuguese people um, before 1900, they might have the mother's maiden name. They might have adopted the surname of uh, nobility like Avila and Betancourt are common noble names in Portuguese. So it does not apply to all European countries or all countries in the world. However, this country, it can be helpful. Mitochondrial DNA is the DNA that follows along a mother's line. A mother passes it on to her children. Males receive their mother's mitochondrial DNA, but they do not pass it on to their children. Only uh, females pass it on to their children, but it can be used to trace a female line. And I do have an example that, that can show you how to use that. Uh, the SMP... I usually refer to it as SNP. Some people say SMP. It stands for single nucleotide polymorphism, which is a big mouthful, so you can see why I just say SNP testing. But what SNP testing does is it confirms your deep ancestral origins on the direct line. So a SNP test will confirm your deep ancestral origins on, a, on the mitochondrial line or on the white chromosome line. As to my knowledge, Family Tree DNA is the only company that does free SNP confirmation testing on mtDNA. Not on the Y, though. Um, they only do it if there's a questionable thing, if, if um, something arises where one uh, origin might look like another. It's called convergence, but I was trying to avoid the technical <laughs> stuff. So then the last kind of test is an autosomal test, and that one is more recent ancestry. That one will give you information and, uh, on, on your genealogy for both uh, your mother's and your father's lines, it goes back about five generations. I usually tell people it can go back about 1600s, you know, depending on how many generations you have in between, but I see enough success stories in the 1600s that it can go back that far. Um, it's quite a common occurrence, so um, it, it's more recent time frame the autosomal DNA. So where does it come from? There's really only two sources where uh, DNA comes from to be able to uh, show relationship to people. 
or for ancestral purposes, and one is from ancient remains. Um, I have up here a picture of Marie Antoinette because uh, they had found a locket that had a lock of her hair in it, and because it hadn't been touched, you know, in the, the over a hundred years since she died, um, the hair had not been contaminated, it was still in pretty good shape, it had not broken down, so they were able to get viable mtDNA from it, but that is um, not the general uh, rule. Usually, um, like, oftentimes you see um, mourning wreaths or hairpins, people have touched those, they become contaminated, they break down, some companies wouldn't want to test them unless they had the root. It just depends. It's also very expensive. So the genetic gene genealogy companies do not generally do such forensic type of testing like with um, hair uh, with Marie Antoinette. Uh, but where it did, was useful with Marie Antoinette is they found a heart in a goblet under a cathedral in Paris, and it was labeled with her son's name. And in 2004, they tested the heart they tested the hair they matched, and they gave her, uh, her son a state funeral. So um, I think that as time goes on, though, and technology advances, we might see more um, forensic-type purposes come about. The one I'm waiting for is stamps. I have old letters of my ancestors with, right, everybody's nodding, going, yes, yeah, stamps. Um, I have stamps that I'm saving. I put them in a you know nice dry place uh, to, to to try to preserve the DNA as much as possible because unless I find some long lost cousin out there, that's my only shot to get my grandfather's DNA. Um, my grandfather came from Scotland. Uh, there are no other male McCallums in um, the United States, so unless I find one in Scotland or even here, because originally my McCallum line came from here. They they came from Ireland and they went to be coal miners in Scotland and then went to America. The way that we generally get DNA, though, for genetic genealogy, is from living descendants. And Family Tree just uses a simple swab of saliva from inside the cheek. And then there's a couple of other companies that also use different kinds of swabs. And then they also have uh, where you can expectorate into a vial. But for the most common way is the, the swab. Uh, Family Tree DNA also stores the DNA for 25 years for free, which comes in handy if you want to upgrade, or if you're, especially if you're a female and you're testing a male relative as a proxy, that way you can upgrade even if they pass away, which happened in my case. I tested my father in 2003, and uh, he passed away that same year. So later on in my talk, you'll see where that came in handy that they do it like that. So this is a chart to show you the path of transmission for the Y chromosome, um, for a male, they receive it from their father. It's just a direct paternal line. Um, this is a uh, shot of the Y chromosome tree. Uh, geneticists have been able to map this and, and with different placement on the tree. And up here, you see Adam in quotes, because what science has uh, found is that they have found that all males descend from one common ancestor and all females descend from one common female ancestor, so they're, they're referred to as Adam and Eve, you know, just in quotes. But um, just to let you know, too, the dates of those changes, they keep changing all the time, and they seem to be going farther back in time, which is really interesting. But this is for the deep ancestral origins, which, again, I'll talk more about that in a moment. So these are different on the deep ancestral origins. They're called haplogroups. And uh, these are the ones that are very common in Ireland. And as you can see, R1B down there is the most common one in Ireland. So when you get into this and you start doing this, you learn that these different uh, letter and number combinations will provide the origins of where supposedly in the world they came from. And R1B is the most common one in Western Europe. So when you hear Western Europe, you, you know, it's hard to get excited about that because that doesn't tell you very much. So, like, my father is R1B, so, you know, Western European. However, um, you are very lucky, and you even have him sitting in the room right here. <laughs> Professor Dan Bradley was part of a study at Trinity University in Dublin, or college in Dublin. Um, we refer to it often in the genetic genealogy community as the Nile, the Nine Hostages study. And what they did is they studied many male Y chromosomes, and especially in Clan O'Neill, and found um, a common genetic signature. 
and they were able to confirm it with a SNP. Remember that big, long, single nucleotide polymorphism? So the SNP M22 confirms Northwest Irish on a, on a male Y chromosome. And you don't see a lot of that out there, so you're very fortunate to be able to have that, that research and that, that confirmation to, to refine down the R1B haplogroup. Um, in family tree DNA, because of their research, um, they have been volunteers have been able to set up a project for males who are able to confirm that they have the SNP for Northwest Irish, the M222 SNP. So you're able to join this project and learn more about it. And again, as time and research goes on, this will keep being refined down. Everything keeps getting more and more refined further. Um, when you test through family tree DNA, you get a certificate similar to this, and it gives you your, your Y chromosome results, which are you know, number and letter combinations. Um, you don't derive much meaning from this until you you're able to compare it to other males in the database. So I know this is kind of hard for you to see, but there's no way to make it bigger and without losing all the information. But this um, the certificate was for a Withrow, who's from Ireland, and um, he, his ancestors immigrated in 1692, and people that have been brick walled, that have this surname, have been able to match him, and it gets them through their brick wall. So once you're able to compare it to other males, that's where you de derive the real benefit to, to be able to get through those brick walls and learn more about your ancestry. Um, additionally, um, some researchers have been working and trying to find a Scots modal, like there's a Northwest Irish modal and the SNP. They've also done research for the Scott model. So I included this too because the Withrow is only two markers off um, on the Scott's model haplotype, which, you know, there's only seven miles between the Ireland and Scotland, so there was a lot of back and forth, so this is an uh, uncommon mm -hmm. thing to see. Seven? Seventeen? Oh, sorry. So um, one of my projects that I do is McCallum, Malcolm, McCollum. That's what my tartan is here. My mother's maiden name was McCallum, and as I said earlier, they immigrated from Scotland, but they were originally from Ireland. And one of the neat things about having a clan project, so first off, you know, people that were in clans often joined clans as a protectorate. So they are obviously not going to have the same wine chromosome. And as you can see, these are all different groupings of McCallums. But one of the neat things to be able to see is that even with the surname variants, they still have a matching Y chromosome. So in this group, we have a McCollum, we have a Malcolm, we have a McCallum, we have a McCollum with a U. So, um, and, and two, all of their origins are also that R1B, the Western European. Some, some have a longer uh, haplogroup branches to find out. And again, in time, there will be corresponding SNPs, I believe, that will refine down the places just like with the Northwest Irish. So, um, but I wanted to show this to you. This is a great example of what clan projects could do for you. Um, another surname that is very common here in Ireland, and also Scotland, England, France, and Germany, is Lyon. And I just recently found out um, last year that I had a Lyon ancestor. And this Lyon ancestor had descendants that went out all over the Isles. They're in Scotland, they're in Ireland, but they're primarily in England this particular lion ancestor. The lion supposedly came over with William the Conqueror, but it is the same lion, lion that Elizabeth Bowes, lion the queen mum is from. So even though the queen mum doesn't have a white chromosome because we know what her genealogy is, we know that these lions are related to, this is the um, DNA signature of her lion ancestors. It also, uh, another thing to point out to, to you here, is that many of these lions were brick walled and if it wasn't for DNA testing, we wouldn't have gotten through to that. Um, so the path of mitochondrial DNA, I have up here female child, but it also applies to the male child. The males and females both receive mitochondrial DNA from their mother. This is my father, and that's me on his back. And um, so obviously he would not have passed his mitochondrial DNA on to me. He was an only child. This is his mother in the middle. This is taken in Aberdeen, Scotland. And um, so my grandmother's in the middle, my great-grandmother and great-great-grandmother. So they all have the same mitochondrial DNA as my father. Um, my 
The grandmother is also an only child. So when you have a situation like that, if I had not tested my father when I did in 2003, and if Family Tree DNA did not store his DNA, I would not have been able to upgrade it and know what my mother, my grandmother's mitochondrial DNA is. And because I did and was able to upgrade it, I know that my father in my grandmother's line is a mitochondrial haplogroup H, which H is kind of like the equivalent of the R1B for the Western Europe. It's the most common out there. But again, one of the neat things you can do is you can do mapping. And in here later on, I have a, I'll show you how to do the mapping. But um, these are all the common um, mtDNA haplogroups for Ireland. Um, the names in the middle, if you've ever read Brian Sykes, The Seven Daughters of Eve, which is a fairly popular book, it's often found in the library. Those are the names that correspond with that. Now, I'm going to interject for a moment and tell you, so go up to here. Uh, this is the transcript for my mitochondrial line, female line ancestor. Um, she, she left Cork in 1848 on a, on a famine ship for America. And so when I did my mitochondrial DNA test, I fully expected that my mitochondrial DNA would come back one of these, something that's common in Ireland. Well, surprise, surprise, it did not. My mitochondrial is happily group N, which is not indigenous to Ireland, not common in Ireland, it is found here. So, it, and the bulk of my matches are in Italy. So it's kind of funny, sometimes I tell people that and they say, oh, you look Italian. But yeah, you know how long ago that was? So, um, you know, not being an N from Ireland, you know, how did that happen? So because we don't have records for it, all I can do is come up with a hypothesis. So this is the hypothesis that I think happened. I think that my long ago female line ancestor went into Britain during, um, with the Romans and then came into Ireland possibly during Cromwell's reign. Now, my uh, ancestor surname, the one that's on the ship, see how far, right, this one right here, her name is Julia English. Now, English is not an Irish surname, so <laughs> that's kind of a clue that it, you know, I might not have Irish DNA, but the thing is, they, when they immigrated, they settled in Chicago. They were Irish Catholic by all, um, you know, in records, all external purposes. This was their church holy family in Chicago. Um, so then the question is, you know, if I don't have, sorry, two more as I keep doing that. If I don't have DNA that is indigenous to Ar Ireland, am I really Irish? Well, my answer is yes, because you, you choose whether or not you want to incorporate that into your identity. And my ancestors identified as Irish, I'm Irish. Because when do you really stop being one thing or another? You know, it's funny because, like, when we come over to Britain and, and Ireland and other countries, um, a lot of times people are kind of, uh, they think it's funny that Americans, if you ask an American what they are, they don't usually say I'm an American. They say I'm Scottish, I'm Irish, I'm English. And that's because... You know, baseball and hot dogs don't make up our DNA. That co the country's only 200 years old. And most of us, our parents have raised us with um, the traditions and um, things of our past. Like my mother always said, well, you like potatoes because you're Irish. <laughs> so, and then, you know, we go to Highland Games over there. We, we know what bangers and mash are. We have an appreciation for it. So as far as I'm concerned, even not being, having DNA indigenous to Ireland, I'm Irish. So um, one of the things I wanted to point out to you is, is now some of you might know that in Cork there's quite a few people with the surname of English. And you have one of the impediments that you have here is the 1922 destruction of records. Now we don't have that in America, although the U.S. Civil War did cause a lot of destruction in courthouse records, especially in the South. But for the most part, other than our 1890 census, which was burned, we have pretty good records. So possibly, if you were to DNA test and you had an ancestor named English, and I'm going to show you another example of this too coming up, you, if you tested me, then that possibly could get you through your brick wall using American parish records. Because another thing too is the Irish have a common uh, forename naming system, like with Mary and John and that sort of thing. So another thing too is, so my mother... 
Um, this is on my mother's results. Um, it shows Julia English from Cork is family tree DNA has a mapping system. So if when you DNA test and you are able to look at the map, then you can also go in and compare your results to other people with same similar surnames or geographical areas, and the computer will tell you, um, give you a color coding, and the, the colors are down here on, on your match, and then you can contact that person and compare. And on this particular one, the surname is Leiden. And these people just recently got a match where, again, the 1922 record destructions had them stuck. And so, but they found a family that had common, both had a Leiden ancestor, and they had common uh, forenames in the family. So they asked the other person to MTDNA test, they matched, and then they also further corroborated it with a family finder test. So I'm going to go back just a little bit, make sure I, but this is my... Julie English's daughter, Johanna Powell. Um, so I don't have a picture of Julie English, so that was the best I could do. Um, again, too, this is a map that shows um, ancestral migration origins, but it's, it's personalized. And the person down here, June, was another person that had Irish, was an Irish mitochondrial N. So even though it's very rare, it's not totally unheard of. Um, autosomal DNA, again, covers all of your lines back to about five generations is where it goes, so that's why it shows all the branches of the tree, the green. Um, one of the things it does is it also gives you origins. Now, the origins are not refined on very much. This is, um, it says 100% European, which, you know, again, tell me something I don't know, right? But as time goes on, this will be refined more down. You also might get a surprise, like, that was, this one's my brother. Now, siblings don't inherit the exact same amount of autosomal DNA from their parents. So my brother comes back 100% European, while I come back with, I call it the pie slice, or pizza slice of Jewish DNA. And I don't have any known Jewish ancestry. However, I do have, on my mother's grandfather's side, I have an ancestor from, uh, it was called Bohemia back then, but it's now Austria or Czechoslovakia. So that's a possibility where the Jewish DNA came from. And further, this is my son's uh, autosomal DNA results, and he has a big blue pie slice, or see which one is it, oh, the orange pie slice is Native American. The Jewish is the, the blue one, it changed the colors on him for some reason, but um, he has Native American from my husband's side. Another thing you get on the autosomal DNA test, the family finder test, is uh, a picture of your 22 chromosomes. I'm the dark blue. These are known cousins of mine. Uh, the one on the bottom that's orange, he is my first cousin once removed. So that's why you see more orange on the chart. And the, the other two are fourth cousins. And so anywhere that you see overlap, like the dark blue, the green, and the orange, and then there's another one, the light blue, the dark blue, and the orange. Anywhere you see that on the map, that's where we inherited DNA from a common ancestor. Now this, these particular cousins match me. My middle name is Bolt and they match me on my, from my Bolt ancestor. So I know that I'm looking at DNA from my father in myself when I look at this. So, you know, I think that's one of the best things in sliced bread. So exciting. Um, the, the test gives you matches to known. These are known relatives. I'm very concerned about privacy, so I don't usually show uh, matches to strangers who I do not have their permission to show. These, this is myself, my husband, and uh, my brother, and this is the results from my son. So that's, it's cleared with all my family to be able to show you that. But the computer automatically knows, um, based on the amount of DNA you share, what the relationship is. And then if the person has entered the surnames, it will highlight those surnames and show um, what surnames you have in common. So that's where you can find matches with strangers and, and also be able to do the DNA matching for the known relatives. So resources to learn more about um, genetic genealogy is, as Moore said, I'm the director of ISOG, which is International Society of Genetic Genealogy. It is free to join. This is our website to join. We have mailing lists. We do um, shows. Like, we usually have a, a stall at Who Do You Think You Are, and we will next year over in London. So um, we try to help as much as possible, because our philosophy is if you have extra money, don't spend it on joining another uh, society. Just spend it on a DNA test, right? <laughs> um, recommended books. 
Uh, Seven Daughters Eve is kind of old and outdated, but if you haven't, haven't read it, it's a good beginning book, for especially for mitochondrial. Most people that, that um, do mitochondrial testing do enjoy reading that book. Um, the, the Who Do You Think You Are companion novel, that is for the American version of the, the Who Do You Think You Are show. Um, I don't think there is one for the British version, however, the book, because Megan Smolniak is a, a professional genealogist, especially if you're just starting out in genealogy, it, it has a lot of great of that beginning content, and she does include DNA in there, along with the celebrity profiles from the first year of the show. Um, two other books that I recommend are uh, Debbie Kennett's DNA and Social Networking, and Debbie Kennett is here. In fact, she just spoke right before mm -hmm. me, and she's down at the Family Tree DNA stall. And she also has a lot of great beginning content in her book. And then Chris Pomery's Family History and the Genes, which is available from the, uh, the UK National Archives. It's a, a very small book, but again, it's another good starter book. So, and they're also more um, focused for British and other British Isles research than, say, the American, <laughs> American version books. So... Um, I will be happy to answer questions right now. I will be happy to stay after and answer questions if you like. Or also, I will be down at the Family Tree DNA stall, which is stands 40 to 44. So, thank you very much. Great, thanks very, very much. Um, just a quick question. The, I think a lot of people here in Ireland are stuck at that 1800 brick wall. Um, have you come across a lot of examples of people uh, jumping across to America to go back an extra generation in order to go back a generation on their side as well? Not, well, it depends to what kind of DNA. You see it more common in Y chromosome testing, but I, you know, I totally, when I was going through the mitochondrial slides, I skipped this slide, which is very important, and it's the Kelly sisters, which, you know, Kelly's a good Irish name. These two sis, uh, descendants from these two uh, Kellys, Martha Kelly and Catherine Kelly, they believed they were sisters, but they didn't know for sure. So they uh, both DNA tested and it corroborated that Elizabeth Cummings was a common ancestor. So that, that would be an example of where you can use mitochondrial DNA for what you're asking for. But you more often see it, of course, with Y chromosome DNA. But this, this too is great because, especially with females, since we don't keep our surnames, we live and we marry, um, this is a way to get through those kinds of brick walls. Anybody have any questions for Catherine? Yep, we have one here. And I'm one of those N triple twos, and uh, I'm wondering how we got that uh, connection to Nile. Is that through the O'Neill's descendants? Yes. I haven't had a chance to read that article. So. And you definitely would want to stay for the next speaker, too, since he was one of the people that worked on the study. My great-grandmother was like, I think uh, it was one of my cousins that did that. That's great. Uh, isn't it true that the M22, 222, there's very few O'Neills among them? If you look at the, if you look at the Hapla group, there's almost no O'Neills. Do you want to answer that one? Dan Bradley from Trinity College, <laughs> if you don't mind. Um, there's a difference between the Eneal and O'Neill. O'Neill is a particular name. The email is a group of names, um, and the linkage was with the email, not with O'Neill. O'Neill itself is a much more complex name, with multiple origins. Yeah, I think I think uh, the, the name O'Neill doesn't derive from Nile Nagolak or Nile of the Nine Hostages. It's from a later Nile. Thank you, Catherine. Very interesting presentation. One of uh, the comments I'd make is the advantage of jumping over to the U.S. side is you're you're getting all of these census uh, records, but also you tend to get photographs. Which uh, mm -hmm. if if, uh, if you had people who left Ireland in the famine, they probably didn't have family photographs. 
once he went over to the States, you get the the birth, the marriage, the death, you get a whole, and, and it's really nice having those on the family tree. Um, yes, thank you. Hi, Catherine, thanks for your Hi. good talk. Hi. <laughs> I'm just wondering if you can recommend either one of the books that you mentioned, our website, or something with the kind of a, a dummy's guide to understanding your results. <laughs> <laughs> I've had testing done, and you know some of it is great, but I, I kind of struggle with when something is between third and fifth cousins or fourth and sixth. So to, to answer your question, uh, it's kind of complex. The answer could lie in some of those books. I mean, I've when I've read books, when it, especially when I was just starting out, one of the early books I read was Trace Roots with DNA by Ann Turner and Megan Zlodniak. And it did answer some questions for me, but I get, uh, I often find that it's easier to post the question to a mailing list and then a volunteer will answer it directly. Um, you're also, you can call the company or email the company. Sometimes it takes, a, they get some, such a high volume of email, you don't always get, get the reply right away, but they will answer it. And then um, the, as, the other, the one other thing I can recommend too is ISOG has a wiki, and there's almost an answer to everything in the ISOG wiki, just about. Debbie Kennett does a tremendous amount of fantastic work on the ISOG wiki, so, and Tom Hutchison and a couple other people. So, thank you. Hi, Catherine. Uh, I had uh, the good fortune to hook up with uh, American relatives who left. Uh, before the famine, they left in 1840 from a particular part of Ireland, so I have traced my roots backwards. And I think I just want to make the point that you know genes are very useful for you know the markers for tracing, but they actually code what we do and the like. And when I met this lady, and we're, you're talking sorts of lines that are separated over 150 years, what struck me was family likenesses and mannerisms that I could see in my own family members that she had, and she was in the U.S. for generations. That's neat. That's great. Thanks for sharing. Catherine, hello. Hi. Nice meeting you. Nice meeting you. Um, I haven't found the mtDNA testing does anything for me. I've done all three. I haven't done any SNP testing for my father. The names are different. I, I don't see any matches. It's supposedly we're identical with the people that I match on. I, I don't recognize anything. So, yeah, I hear that a lot, especially because again, we have the impediment of not being able to use surnames to trace female lines. I, and I hate to say this, but it's kind of also a waiting game. Because if you think yeah. about it, the, the databases have just recently reached the one million mark of one million people tested. But if you think about one million, that's, not yeah, that's like what the population of San Francisco. <laughs> that's, it's, it's a very little amount, so a lot of it is a waiting game. Um, the National Geographic Genographic Project has also brought in hundreds of thousands of samples. So I had a, it's a kind of a success story, and I had to wait several years for it. My husband also has a lion line, and his lion line is different than mine. So someone tested through the Genographic Project, uploaded their results into Family Tree DNA, which is free to do, and this person uh, was actually stuck in England in the 1850 census is as far back as he could go. But the, where it gave me a success is that we were stuck in New York in 1809. So, but as far as research goes, I know I can exclude Scotland, Ireland, Germany, and France and focus on England because of the match. So that's kind of the thing too that you can do with mtDNA. That's why I was showing the mapping system was if you click on the, the different dots on the map when you go into your result. By the way, I, I'm the, a co-administrator with Morris on the Ireland mtDNA project. And we, which is through Family Tree DNA, it's free to join the project once you've tested, that is. And you can, you're also welcome to have your family finder results in there. But when, because you're in that database and in that project, you can compare it with other people in the project. It makes it a little easier. So, but, it's oftentimes, too, it's a waiting game. You just have to wait for the right person to test. Like, your right person might be in this room right now. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> but you, you never know. That's why I'm here. Yeah. None of you? McCluskies, <laughs> <laughs> please. So what would actually happen if more Irish people tested? <clears throat> well, it'd be great. They'd have more success stories. More getting through those brick walls of that 1922. Mm -hmm. 
which brings the topic of the Irish DNA Atlas. Um, my father Tess is an E1B, 2%. Um, we do not match any of the other McCluskeys that I grew up in Philadelphia with. Um, they're South Philly, they don't count. Um, if we had more people testing, then I could find um, E1Bs and find out whether or not we're non-paternal or dense, and you know, we're really something else. All my, my father's matches are in Scotland. Now, the North, Scotland and Ireland goes back and forth. So I'm hoping to find somebody who's, who's doing a, a project on that. I'm on a bunch of different projects that have to be in it. Elster Heritage as well? I am, yes. Yes. So there's two more things I want to tell you. One is um, the, um, gosh, what's the university where Bruce Winnie's at? I'm blanking on it. Is it not Leicester? It's, um, he is in Oxford. Is Oxford? It? Yeah. He's doing a project called The People of the British Isles. Yes. And once they publish that data, because uh, what it, they went through and got participants that have four <laughs> grandparents all from the same place. Once that data gets dumped into the, when it becomes public and gets added to, added to the databases, we'll see a lot more refinement, not just in uh, the, I think, well, more so in the population thing. But one of the things, too, that could be impeding you on the McCluskey, besides the, um, that it could be a clan, is the Irish practice of fostering, is where. Okay. Do you want to know more about that? Uh, I was talking to somebody yesterday. The Irish practice of fostering, as I always thought that the foster child adopted the name of the foster parents, but apparently that is not always true. Um, they, even though fostering was quite common in Ireland, I heard yesterday that uh, they didn't always adopt the name of the new foster parents. So if they had adopted the name of the new foster parents, then you're going to have a non-paternity event, yep. a break in that okay. transmission of the Y chromosome. Okay. Um, but apparently it's not uh, as what we, what we might think. Is that, but I, I don't know, is anybody else now, heard that? on fostering, yeah. wasn't it uh, kind of one of the practices where your enemies could take your children, if your children becomes part of that family? My, my experience of this has come from a term that I wasn't aware of before, uh, but more of social adoption than fostering. Uh, and then at the age of 14, apparently the child was told the story and given the option as to what surname he adopted or she adopted. And that experience proved to be proven to be true. Uh, and the account came from two different, although they, <laughs> they didn't know at the time, but they were related people who give me the two different accounts. Mm -hmm and explained how the individual came across the name. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think the term social adoption is more prevalent in the north and fostering mm -hmm. in the south, you know. Mm -hmm. But there were definitely protocols about it that we, that, that probably aren't so well documented. Mm -hmm. yeah. So why would somebody do that? If they were daughtered out, would they adopt a son? No, it was more, correct me if I'm wrong, but, um, is more a practice of a, an enemy, some, I don't know what the reason is, but a, someone's enemy being able to take their child. Um, Jared, yeah. on, the, on the question of the reference uh, data sets, it's very important. So we need to get more reference data sets in Ireland. There are two projects which are ongoing at the moment. One is the Irish DNA Atlas, mm -hmm. which is Dr. Jim Piero Cavelli of the Royal College of Surgeons. Uh, they, they have about, I, I'm part of that, but they have about a hundred, so they, they, they need an awful lot more volunteers for and that. And it's free as well. Right, and it's free. So maybe if you go down to the GSI stand, they will sign you up for that, okay? If you have eight ancestors who came from the same general area. Another one is one I started with, uh, um, I'm reaching out, which is the Irish DNA Roots Project, and they're, they're using at the moment 23 and me, but they, they've got several hundred people up there. Another very, very interesting one is Dr. Spencer Wells came over and tested 100 people in Mayo for the genographic project. And they're still working on the results. I got some of the preliminary results, and they're very, very interesting. So we need an awful lot more of these reference data sets. Will you be yeah. talking about any of those results in your talk? Yes, all of them. That's yeah. good. Right. Okay. good. So Jared will be talking tomorrow, tomorrow evening, tomorrow evening at about 5.30. So if you want to hear more about the results in these various projects that are going on, 
and certainly make 5.30 a, uh, a beeline. Mm -hmm. oh. um, in relation to adoption and fostering, um, I think a lot of the fostering would have been written down in Brehan law, if I'm not mistaken. So there would have been laws about fostering and adoption in Ireland, um, and it was a means of social cohesion. People, the children would be fostered to, to encourage social cohesion. Um, but I'm no expert on, on that. Um, we have a question down here, or a comment. In, in this point, you won't want to think. I'm not saying they have a point. I'm not dying or something. In relation, I would actually take a photo of the name, and actually raise them themselves. It's actually a deeper name, so. I've seen it, but I've seen an awful lot of times I've seen this, like, you know. Yeah. It's all generations, like. Any other questions, then? Yeah. No? Okie dokie. Well, can I just uh, thank Catherine again for a wonderful presentation and thanks everybody for contributing yeah. to a really, really interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you We've had some people in the United States. Hello,